We have long-term survival data from ruxolitinib that is favorable uh, from both studies. Both studies had crossover designs, which does limit the analysis as it relates to survival. However, utilizing different statistical techniques that account for the impact of crossover, uh, we clearly see in pool analysis that there is a very significant improvement in survival. I think clinicians see this in their practice. As an individual that cares for many patients with myelofibrosis, there is no question in my mind that the survival advantage is very real. Uh, there are patients that remain on the Ruxolitinib, even from the days of the early clinical trials in 2007 and 2008, these are individuals that when they enrolled in the study had expected survivals of under three years. There is no question this drug prolongs survival. The main adverse events associated with ruxolitinib are the potential for the development of cytopenias, particularly anemia and thrombocytopenia. These are typically managed by the modification of the dose. I find that those cytopenias are very front-loaded, and I will tend to start a patient on 10 milligrams twice a day if their counts are, are compromised. The important piece we've learned over time is that once a patient is on a stable dose, sometimes escalation of the dose is important to get the optimal response. I would say in 2018, one unmet need is adequate dosing of ruxolitinib. I do see many patients that are probably on suboptimal doses of ruxolitinib. It is okay to start a patient on five milligrams twice a day if they have marked thrombocytopenia. However, over time, it is probably crucial for the efficacy of the drug to increase that dose further. There is no such thing as a perfect drug, and accordingly, even ruxolitinib is not a perfect drug. It has side effects. And there are some side effects that were known from the onset, from very early development of the drug, from the phase one studies, and some side effects that gain in significance after a much larger experience with many patients. Perhaps the most significant side effects of ruxolitinib is the development of anemia. And sometimes it's a trade-off. The patient feels much better, but the hemoglobin is getting worse. We noted that in several of the patients, there is a dip in the hemoglobin typically by two to three months of therapy, and in some of them, it tends to recover a few months later. But it's not a generalized rule. In some patients, the anemia can persist and be significant, and we have not developed effective means to reverse it. So it can affect, in a major way, the ability to treat the patients with adequate dose of ruxolitinib. Another important side effect of ruxolitinib that perhaps um, did not, uh, was not subject to that much of attention early, but appears to be a rather significant toxicity, is that of immunosuppression and development of opportunistic viral, fungal, and bacterial infections. And for the doctor who uses ruxolitinib, he has to have awareness for the risk of development of those infections. And when this develops, it's not necessarily a reason not to continue with ruxolitinib, but upon recovery from the infection, it may require dose reduction. Ruxolitinib has been approved since 2011, and prior to that, we were using it in clinical trials since 2007 in the comfort studies. Um, it's clearly proven itself to be effective in reducing spleen and symptoms. Um, what it doesn't probably do is have a significant anticlonal activity, meaning that the disease can still persist um, and progress even on a, on a JAK inhibitor like ruxolitinib. The median time to discontinuation of the drug is approximately three years. Um, so patients and physicians alike have to be aware of that um, and have to prepare uh, for the possibility that at some point they may need to switch therapies, whether it's an experimental therapy um, or be prepared to, pr uh, to move on to stem cell transplantation.